my meeting. All right, Jude. You can go ahead and mute. That would be perfect. Awesome, awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to wait just a couple of moments to let folks file in and join us. Thank you all for being here. We're so excited to go birding with you and uh, from all over the country, which is really exciting um, and talk about accessibility. If you would like to enable closed captions, I'm also putting this in the chat. If you would like to enable closed captioning for this webinar, you can go ahead and click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and that will um, reveal the transcripts as we're talking if you would like to have closed captioning. Um, but while we are um, just waiting folks to join us, if you don't mind go ahead, going ahead and putting in the chat where you all are tuning in from, and if you've had any bird sightings that are interesting to you, feel free to share that with us. Uh, where are you tuning in from and any cool bird sightings that you've had recently? I'll have to say just today, I was at a city of Atlanta park. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, doing a bird walk with folks who are um, living in that particular area of the park that I was in and a beautiful green heron flew over and all the kids went wild. It was wonderful. It was quite wonderful. <laughs> we got Michael from Detroit. Hello from Detroit. Thanks for being here. I love the D. It's a wonderful city. All right, all right, all right. So um, it's 12 3, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Cartersville, we got Cynthia from Cartersville, Georgia. Good to see you, or good to be with you, I guess, um, since we can't see you all, unfortunately. Um, but my name is Karina Newsom. I am the Community Engagement Manager with Georgia Audubon. And today we are uh, hosting one of our quarterly virtual accessible field trips in collaboration with BirdAbility. Um, Georgia Audubon is an organization dedicated to building places where birds and people thrive through conservation, education, and community engagement. And BirdAbility is a phenomenal organization that works nation, even worldwide, that is dedicated to making birding and the outdoors accessible for everybody, um, focusing specifically on people um, who have disabilities or experience accessibility challenges or health, have health concerns. Um, as they are out birding. And so we're very grateful for the work that they are doing to make birding what it should be, equitable and accessible. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and have our incredible panelists who are with us today um, to introduce themselves, tell us where they're birding with us from, um, what disability or accessibility challenge they may experience. Um, and uh, then we're gonna go ahead and start moving down the trails that we're all birding on and go from there. So I will first start with uh, Corey, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining us and, and sharing a little bit about who you are and where you are. Thank you, Karina. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Corey Lycopolis, um, education assistant with Audubon Southwest. Uh, we're a regional office for the National Audubon Society. And I'm burning here from our Santa Fe office at the Raymond Davy Audubon Center. Um, some disability um, challenges I experience because um, of my time in the military, I've had uh, multiple uh, spinal surgeries and have uh, both of my um, ankles are fused in multiple joints. Um, so that limits uh, mobility uh, for my feet and ankles. Um, so when I'm out on the trails, I have to be very um, cautious of um, uneven terrain and extreme slopes. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Corey. We're so excited to have you with us. Um, I'll go ahead now. Um, Body and Judy are actually together birding. And so um, we're going to hear from both of them. We'll go ahead and start with you, Bonnie, um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself um, okay. and then passing it over to Judy. All right. Well, I am Bonnie Lukowitz, the inept camera person for today. Um, so if you see the camera moving around, that's because I'm a quad. <laughs> um, and we are here in Oakland, California, bundled up because it's cold today, our typical summer. And we're at uh, Lake Merritt, did I already say that? Anyway, I am uh, with Bay Area Outreach Recreation Program and have just started a birding for all program. 
and Judy is my sidekick. Good morning. Glad to be with you all. Um, I am also a quad. I use a power wheelchair and Bonnie and I do a lot of uh, hiking and birding together. And as Bonnie mentioned, we're at the gardens at Lake Merritt, which is pretty much in the heart of the city of Oakland. It was the first bird sanctuary in the United States. Um, the garden is really fascinating and we'll talk more about that, but there's also the lake. So we have terrestrial birds and shore birds and water birds here. Awesome, that is incredible. And I cannot wait to learn more Bonnie and Judy. Thank you so much. And then finally we will um, end last but not least with the founder of BirdAbility who is with us today, Virginia Rose. Um, please tell the world who you are. We're so excited to meet you. Hi everybody, I'm Virginia Rose, founder of BirdAbility. Thank you so much for being with us. I am at one of my very favorite parks in Austin called Richard Moya. And it has a number of huge, beautiful, tall pecan trees. And it also has a mower <laughs> who is following me around um, annoyingly. So anyway, I just want to tell you very quickly about this park. Super accessible, beautiful sidewalk, wide, flat. Um, the grades are perfect. Uh, we've got a little Onion Creek here. It's little right now, but it's raging in various times of the year. Um, we have great riparian birds. Um, my videographer and very, very good friend, Celeste, is here with us. Say hey, Celeste. And, <laughs> and hey. Um, so we have 12 birds, right, already? So far, 12 today, or 15, 12 yeah. 15. Um, Anyway, uh, what else am I supposed to say? Uh, oh, Austin, Texas, Burnability. Uh, oh, I'm a paraplegic. Um, I've been in a wheelchair for 48 years and started birding about 20 years ago where I found my true love and my best self. I love that, true love and best self. That's probably one of the best ways to, scri to describe what birding does for all of us. Um, so we're so excited to have all these incredible people here with us today. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everyone who's listening knows that it's really important. Um, a lot of times, especially right now, uh, many institutions, organizations, and people are talking about making birding equitable, right? And oftentimes we think about um, people's identities as it relates to their ethnic background or their socioeconomic status, but there are many elements of who a person is that can make something accessible or not accessible. Um, so we want to make sure that birding is accessible for everybody um, and that we are aware of the ways in which the places that we go birding and take people birding um, may exclude certain people, people who have certain disabilities. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking all about that. And we're very, very excited. Um, all right, so as we are walking, is anyone seeing or hearing any birds? Uh, we got really excited because Bonnie and Judy just a couple of minutes ago spotted a bush tit. And one of the really cool things about what we have going on right now um, is that there are many birds that both Bonnie, Judy and uh, uh, Virginia are seeing that I've never seen in my life. So I'm so excited to get some lifers today. Um, Bonnie and Judy, are you hearing or seeing any birds where you are right now? We are hearing a big bird in the sky called an airplane. We're also <laughs> hearing a lot of hummingbirds. Um, this garden has a, a huge pollinator section. And so the hummingbirds are pretty, pretty plentiful in here. Um, earlier, we were hearing coweys. I've been hearing lesser goldfinch um, every now and then. And I think I also heard a Buick's wren. A Buick's wren? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. Virginia, we, uh, I <laughs> the hummingbirds we get here mostly are Anna's and Allen's. And the Can roof is in the spring and the fall. Can you describe the Anna's hummingbird? Because in case people have not seen that bird, it is absolutely beautiful, right? Judy, take it away. I didn't hear the question. Oh, the Anna's, describe the Anna's hummingbird. The Anna's is a small, well, actually not the smallest hummingbird. And they are um, in certain light, of course, green. And the males have a bright red throat. 
Um, sometimes I think that they'll have like one or two broods a year, but the fascinating thing about hummingbirds is that they primarily build their nests and keep their nests together with uh, spider webs. So a lot of times at home, I will see them searching my juniper tree or going around the eaves of the house, picking up spider webs. That's amazing. That's awesome. And as hummingbirds are one of the birds that are on my on my list of birds that I absolutely must, must see. They're so incredibly beautiful. Um, Corey, where you are, I see that you are out in open kind of field. Um, what birds are you seeing or hearing right now? I just saw three pine siskins uh, fly by. And then I have a hummingbird a little bit ways in front of me. Um, it's either going to be a uh, broadtail or a black chin hummingbird. Um, let me get the binoculars up and see if we can show everybody. All right, there are little guys further out in the distance. So the hummingbird with a nice green body. Um, its back is towards me, so I can't see it too much. Um, but like I said, the two hummingbirds we have here currently um, are the broadtail and the black chin. And what's really great about the broadtail is you, they create this wonderful buzzing noise um, when they go up high into the sky and then dive down. And they use that as part of their mating uh, ritual with females. So it's great to hear, but can be quite dangerous as they're buzzing around and diving all over the place. I almost got hit in the head um, last week by one. That sounds like a dream come true, being hit in the head by a, a displaying hummingbird. That sounds phenomenal. Uh, Virginia, are you hearing or seeing any birds? I know you've already had a, quite a list where you are. Um, are you all hearing or seeing any birds right now? Oop, looks like she might have frozen. If you can hear me, Virginia. We're back. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay cool. cool. We're back. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of Carolina winds and northern cardinals, and um, I'm seeing a bunch of titmouse fledges, and they're kind of awkward and cute. Um, they're all pretty little and singing pretty high up in the canopy, so I don't have anything like in hand to show you right now. Yeah, and we're 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 battling with airplane, mower, and wind today. So <laughs> the trifecta. <laughs> Awesome. Well, right now I actually have a Carolina wren. I'm going to try to get it in the binoculars. Okay. I don't know if you can hear that. It's like really close to me and it is quite boisterous as pretty much all wrens tend to be. Let me see if I can get it in the binoculars for you. Okay, here we go. We're going to try this. Okay. It's in, in the thickets here. And it looks just like the same color as everything around it. So it might be a little difficult, but Carolina wrens are a nice um, kind of chestnut brownish color and they have a really distinct white stripe above each of their eyes. So that's kind of one of the ways to tell this particular species apart from others. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind describing a little, uh, a little bit of the elements of the trail that you are on that make it accessible. Um, where I am is at a park called Morgan Falls Overlook Park. And this particular park has um, a series of paved trails that actually go along this uh, water body here that allow us to see, oh, there's waterfowl um, right here on the river. The trails are, I wanna say about four and a half to five feet wide. Um, and it apparently is, is a very popular place to, to, to go birding and to recreate. So there are a lot of people typically, um, but they have a pretty large parking lot that has several handicapped parking spaces that have space on the side of the parking lot which is good to create more room um, for people to park and to get out of their vehicles. Um, and so this particular park has a nice diversity of, of habitats for you to experience when you're looking for birds. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and go over to um, Bonnie and Judy, if you wouldn't mind describing a little bit about the park where you are um, and what makes it accessible um, for both of you. Well, I think the primary thing is that um, it's quite level and paved in here and the uh, pathways are in really good shape. There is a parking lot and there are several blue zones there. It's also very convenient to either BART here 
or um, take a bus if you don't drive. And as I said, it's right in down, practically in downtown Oakland. So it's super close to BART stations. And right now we have swallows darting in and out over our head. Okay. Um, there's several, looks like two or three pairs of them. And um, right in front of us is the Airbnb. This is a bee hotel that's part of the pollinator garden here. Airbnb oh. for the bees. That is absolutely yes. incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I saw that you have a, what looks like a scope set up. Um, would you mind describing what you have for wildlife viewing um, when you go out birding? Well, actually, this is uh, binoculars. Uh, or Actually, it's a monocular, which I have found to be uh, easier for me. And I had a uh, machinist uh, develop this for me. I needed something that I could do independently. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's just a, a pipe that fits down into a uh, bracket that he made that's atta permanently attached to my chair. So all I have to do is lift it up and take it out. And so I'm able to do it myself. And it's actually uh, automatic focus. Um, we have a, uh, well, it's attached here. I, I can't do, I can't hold the camera and do this at the same time. Um, but it's a, uh, from a telescope um, that we purchased online. And so it's, uh, I just push a button and it zooms for me, it focuses. Um, so I pretty much hands-free um, and it works out great. I've only used it about three different times. And our plan is to replicate this. Uh, the problem is that attaching it to different chairs, there's no two chairs alike. So trying to, it's going to pretty much have to be customized to the person's wheelchair, but it was important for me to be able to do it myself. Whereas some people, you know, may not care about that. Um, so yeah, it works out great. And it, we put it together for about $150. That is incredible. Um, an automatic focus monocular. Thank you so much for sharing that, Bonnie. Yeah, we were able to get a really good look at that. Thank you so much. Um, all righty. Um, Corey, if you wouldn't mind um, describing um, the features of the place where you are birding right now that make it accessible um, for you to go birding and it's telling us a little bit about that. Um, so right here at the lower part of, of the uh, Audubon Center, um, there are paved uh, walkways, um, stone walkways, and then the uh, dirt trails are leveled. Um, the slopes are not bad at all. They're extremely manageable. Um, so this area is probably the most accessible part of um, the sanctuary. Um, there are, if I could turn the camera around, up here, there are more trails that go deeper into the, the canyon that we're in. Um, unfortunately, those areas are not wheelchair accessible. Um, the only way to get up there are through um, stairs that are fairly steep. Um, I have issues with those stairs sometimes. I actually hurt myself uh, the other day going down those stairs. Um, and then um, down over this way, where I'll be going over to next, uh, is another nonprofit in the area, the Nature Conservancy. Um, they keep their area a little bit more wild than we do. Um, once again, not super wheelchair accessible, um, but once you get down into the area, um, it's flat and the trails are maintained. And that's so kind of these are the kind of areas that I tend to keep at just because um, I know it's not going to be difficult uh, for me uh, going up. I don't have to worry about like steep slopes or anything like that. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, and one of the really cool things about birdability and one of the reasons why it's so important that we shout on the rooftops what makes birdability so awesome, why their mission is so incredible and why what they have to offer is so important is because um, depending on the person, um, what is accessible for one person might not be accessible for another person and vice versa. Um, and so it's really important that we get a really good understanding of the variety of features in a place that make it accessible for a variety of different kinds of people. Um, and birdability has a lot of really, sorry, this is music, <laughs> might start dancing. Um, <laughs> birdability has some really awesome resources to help people understand and think about and notice um, and have the information to know what makes a place accessible. Um, so Virginia, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing 
um, with us some of the resources that the incredible organization of Birdability has to offer um, to inform folks about accessibility. You're unmuted. Oh, hi. Um, I was pointing at what I think might be a summer tanager. Or maybe oh, a wide-eyed wide vireo. vireo. Never mind. <gasps> wide -eyed vireo. Anyway, wide-eyed vireo, summer tanager, either. <laughs> So, um, um, what was your question? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's so, so the funny thing is that it's so hard to like both go birding and talk about like information because the birds are distracting. How could you okay. focus? Yeah. <laughs> so what was essentially, your question? yeah. Um, if you could share with us some of the resources that Birdability has to offer as far as helping people have the information and understand what features make a place accessible, um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing what some of those resources have that Birdability has. Sure. All right. Well, early on, um, I created a document called Access Considerations. And on it, I put nine uh, items that I thought were important. First was parking. Second was curb cuts. Third was bathrooms. Fourth was grades and slopes. Fifth was surface, whether it was concrete or crushed granite or um, asphalt. Um, and then also railing heights. Um, I've been on a lot of really great boardwalks where once I'm on the boardwalk, I can't see anything to my right or to my left. So I just listed as many as I thought was important. And then, of course, realizing this is just for me as a paraplegic. I can't begin to speak for all the other people who have various accessibility challenges. And so the beauty of that document is that it's a living document. And so as we find more and more people with access challenges, they are telling us what needs to be on the survey or on the access document. And so it's just growing leaps and bounds with all kinds of very valuable information for whomever um, is trying to maybe get in the car and do a road trip and hit a few accessible trails on their, on their way, which is what I like to do. So I would say first and foremost, the access considerations is very helpful for anybody. Second, I would say the um, steps to implementing vertibility I just began making a list of all the things that I did in the order in which I did them in order to try to get birdability going in my location. And so those steps, I think, are very clear. I think they're very doable. And it's one of the things, Kalina, that I was struck by after a year or two into birdability. I realized anyone can do this. Anybody can do it. It is not that hard. And so when I listed the steps, I wanted to sort of reach out in the spirit of anybody can pick up the phone, anybody can send an email, and you will get responses, good responses. That's amazing, Virginia. Thank you. Um, Freya McGregor, who is the Birdability Coordinator, who is uh, on the live uh, in the chat, she just put the website to Birdability's uh, access considerations that Virginia was just mentioning. Um, along with some other resources. So please do feel free to, oh, and then the steps to implement. Thank you so much, Freya. Please feel free to go to those, um, to those websites to take a look. And the important thing is that not only is, of course, it important, you'll see me bobbing and weaving through cars right now, trying to get away from some of the noise. So don't mind my background. One of the really cool things about uh, these, these uh, resources that Birdability has is, that, as Virginia said, everyone can use them and it is all of our responsibilities whether you are someone who does have a disability or someone who does not, um, to advocate for our spaces to be accessible. Um, and so I'm so grateful to Breadability for those incredible resources. Um, now, all right, I wanna take a pause to, to leave some space. If folks are seeing or hearing any birds, tell us what you're seeing or hearing. And if you wouldn't mind describing the way the bird looks so that folks like me who are from different parts of the world can get an idea of what you all are experiencing right now. Judy is, uh, well, we're both seeing lots of hummingbirds. And there was one doing the dive with the little tweet at the bottom of the dive, which um, we know is actually their tail making a sound. Um, there are, yeah, the swallows are just really active. And up in the tree in front of us, there I've seen several towies going in and out. We're sitting by a Mexican sage that literally a hummingbird was about six inches away from us. And of course now it's gone. Um, and there's black BB that's been flitting around and also was really close to us. And then of course left, um, but it's, there's quite a, quite a lot of variety today. 
to see. And the bees are very active at this Mexican sage as well. That's amazing. Birds are so good at disappearing the moment we draw anyone else's attention to them. It's like their superpower, it seems. Um, but that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I want to, in case anyone else has seen or heard anything that you want to share, I'll leave a couple of seconds of space here to jump on in. So, Karina, um, I'm not hearing the white-eyed vireo any longer, but um, it's such a beautiful bird. I thought I would just go ahead and describe part of what it looks like um, to its name. Um, it has white eyes and then um, immediately in front of and over, it has this beautiful, very bright yellow spectacle that sort of highlights the whiteness of its eye. And it makes this wonderful sound where it sort of does a chick, doo -doo -doo chick at the beginning and at the end. And it's, it's a surefire white eye very often you're not going to be able to get your eyes on it because they're skulkers, big time skulkers. But sometimes when they decide they will grace you, then you appropriately honor their appearance and then add it to your eBird list and feel grateful. I love that, Virginia, when they decide to grace us because that is definitely what it feels like. Corey, got anything over there for us? Yeah, it looks like we got uh, some more hummingbirds. See if I can get that up on so everyone can take a look. Where'd he go? Come on, there we go. Where is he? And nope, he flew away. Um, it looked like it was a, a black chin hummingbird. Um, so they have black chins they have that green nice green body that we love hummingbirds for but instead of having like a red or orange uh gorget around their neck they have a nice deep black almost velvety um shine to them that is incredible i am very jealous of all the hummingbird activity that everyone seems to be <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. It was an insect. I'm so sorry, everyone. That everyone seems to be having. I just have bugs following me right now. This is also pretty cool. Um, so I was wondering if you all wouldn't mind describing. So of course, birdability has the access considerations um, document and resource that we definitely want people to check out. But in your experiences, um, what have been elements of either physical trails or, or birding locations um, that have impeded your ability to access that place? Um, or programmatically, like if there is a program that someone has hosted um, that in, in, in the way that it's presented or in the way that it's carried out um, does not allow everyone to be able to access or maybe um, you to be able to have access that program. Um, I'd like to give folks, if possible, an understanding of what some of these barriers can actually look like, some maybe being more obvious than others, if you all wouldn't mind sharing. Um, so whoever wants to jump in first, you can definitely feel free. Um, I can go ahead. Yeah. Um, so for me, the two big things are distance. Um, so if, uh, things more than a couple miles, um, it can become really difficult for me. And that's something that's really obvious and really easy to know about trail or an area or program is going to happen because those that's something that um, it's usually shown on a website. Um, the one thing that really gets me the most, though, um, that is not well known and documented for a lot of places is the slope of the trail. Um, so if the slope is too steep, um, yeah, I won't be able to um, walk because my ankles um, and my feet won't bend uh, far enough for me to do so. Um, there's a slight way for me to get around that. Um, if it's not too, too sleep, steep, I can walk uphills, uh, backwards uphills, and that allows me to navigate steeper slopes. Uh, but that is definitely not ideal. And that can be a safety concern in itself, um, not be able to see where I'm actually going. Thank you so much for sharing that, Corey. Um, that is very important to know. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Bonnie and Judy. Um, yep, we were just about to chime in. Perfect. <laughs> I, I know for me, um, at least during the flyway season when the migration, when the birds are migrating here, it's often our rainy season, um, although we haven't had one in a few years, but what happens is that the trails become muddy. And so that can be a problem for uh, doing the migratory birds. Um, and I know for me, a big thing also is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, getting information. 
about what voting places are going to be accessible, um, which is why the mapping that Spurtability is doing is so essential. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And even when, you know, some of the Audubons around here have put out, you know, great brochure, brochures saying, you know, giving the access symbol, but in my opinion, the access symbol is just kind of a green light to go further and investigate what that really means. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's gonna meet all your access needs. So that's why it's so critical to have more detailed information. Um, does the access symbol mean there's an accessible bathroom? Does it mean there's an accessible trail? What does that really mean? So uh, the information barrier I think has really been um, something, you know, mostly overlooked by environmental groups. Um, and then bathrooms are also another big one for me, um, needing to have an accessible bathroom. And I know during COVID, which hopefully things are on the upswing now, the, they closed off all of the uh, multiple user bathrooms and put in porta potties, single user porta potties, but most of them were inaccessible. Um, so it's kind of a constant, uh, challenge when we when we come up against new things happening it's like well don't forget about accessibility um so it's still always on the back burner Jude, did you hey oh i've come across some just ridiculous barriers like there'll be a perfectly level um trail and there's a log in front of it to keep vehicles from driving and the only way you can get around it is um not accessible because there's ruts or you know a pole um, i think the swinging metal gates often people go over or under and obviously bonnie and i can't do that um, i think surface is often a problem and there are a lot of trails that of course as we know upkeeping dirt trails um, is an ongoing process so we found that you know some trails will be good for a few years and then they get pretty rutted um, the other thing is is that a lot of the boardwalks um, on the beaches around here are not maintained and the sand blows over them so then the boardwalk becomes a little bit useless for us but i think bonnie's point about um, websites not having access information i mean even the national parks <laughs> Um, often fall short, our state parks fall short, our local parks fall short, and you often can't even find a drop down menu in the drop down menu any access information at all. And I want to give a huge shout out to Bonnie because she, for God, 20 years has been um, posting detailed travel or trail information, access information on her website and uh, for people in Northern California, it is a go-to. Oh, thanks, Judy. That's incredible. Thank you both, uh, Judy and Bonnie, for sharing that. Before I forget, um, Bonnie, what is the website for Northern California? It is www.accessn, or northernca.org, accessnca.org. Amazing. So if any one of you or if you know anyone who is in Northern California, thank you so much, Bonnie, for having that resource. That's incredible. Please do check it out. Um, and while we're on the topic um, and as we're kind of transitioning over to Virginia, Freya put into the chat and it has been mentioned a couple times by, by Bonnie and Corey also brought up this information that it's not enough to simply say, yes, this place or this trail is accessible or this program is accessible because accessibility is not a blanket statement, right? Um, that inf there needs to be information. What does it mean that it's accessible? What are the particular features there that make it accessible or not accessible? And birdability has just the resource. So Virginia, I was wondering if you could tell us about the birdability map, um, which uh, Freya has put the link to in the chat. So Virginia, if you wouldn't mind sharing kind of what the other folks have been sharing about um, accessibility in your experience, what has um, made programs or locations inaccessible in your experience, and then also the birdability map and why it's so important. All right, um, um, I would just concur with what everyone has said before me, uh, mainly having to do with surface, roots, ruts, rocks, um, occasionally fences, but I'm, 
extremely lucky that I'm really little and fairly active and I can scoot around and under and above things like nobody's business. So I'm lucky. But um, I also um, understand about parking issues, restroom issues, all of those things matter. And that's really where the idea of the vertibility map came from is I wanted to be able to take a road trip and have created an itinerary of accessible parks. And so when that became something we could actually do, um, and we used the um, survey that we came up with originally with those nine considerations, I realized all of a sudden that, oh my gosh, we can be connecting people who have access challenges across the entire country. We could have, this is my big dream, I'm the vision spinner, is to be able to have teams of people who have access challenges in every city. And so I can invite Seattle's disabled team down to Bird in Texas for three or four days, and then they can host, and this team in Austin can go up to Seattle and spend up you know, three or so days. And all of a sudden, the networking across the country of people with access challenges became a possibility, not just birding, but beyond that. So that, that to me is the beauty of the birdability map. Show this. I also wanted to show you a great example of a picnic table, which might be accessible, except that if you'll see me on a sidewalk, now I have to go over this. And she is pushing hard. In order to get to the accessible picnic table. So some people are going to be able to do that. Some people aren't. If it's muddy, it's going to be a mess. So another great example of access. And that would be so easy to add a concrete pad yeah. between those. Two. Awareness. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's great. Um, that, that is a great example, as you were saying, you broke up just a little bit, but we, we, we heard what you were saying about there can be accessible features, but if like what you're seeing in Virginia's screen there, if they're disconnected um, by say a bunch of grass or dirt or mud, um, unfortunately that accessible feature may not be able to be accessed by everyone. And so it's important to kind of think about those features um, that, make, that, that make a place accessible and making sure that those features are themselves uh, accessible um, from the trail, for example. Um, now, for the folks who are in the uh, in the webinar in the chat, if you have any questions, please do feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat, and I will relay them to our guests. So, if you have any questions, please do um, feel free to put them in the chat. One thing that Can I, I would jump like in to real say, quick. Oh, yes, yes. So I got a spotted towhee right here, um, or um, El Rescador in Spanish. They're usually found on the ground. Get this. Where is he? And they have a wonderful, there he is right there. Um, they're a black bird with some orange sides and they get the name spotted because on their wings, they have um, these beautiful spots. And I'm not sure if you can hear it. If we give a second to call. No, it doesn't. Yep. Um, when it calls, um, you can remember it's a uh, call um, because it sounds like it's saying, drink your tea. Um, so it's a great way to um, spot the, or hear the bird um, if you're going around. And they're usually found at the base of trees and under bushes and scrubs because um, they like to dig at the fallen seeds and things like that. That was a perfect shot. Um... Corey, thank you so much. And we and it, that that the sound was definitely coming through the speakers. So thank you. That was amazing. Here in Atlanta, we have the eastern towhee, which looks a little different, but it sounds very similar. But when I it was funny because when I heard the towhee the first time, I think it was actually from maybe um, Bonnie and Judy. I was like, it sounds like a towhee, but it's like it has almost a little bit of a different accent. Is the best way that I can describe it. Um, so the towhees that we have across uh, this continent are absolutely incredible. Um, I wanted to wrap back around to the birdability map just to make sure that everyone who's listening understands that this map 
is important for everyone to contribute to. So the way that it works is when you are at a location where you are birding or doing any sort of outdoor recreation, um, you can go to birdability.com and Freya actually put the link to the map in the chat. Um, and you go to that website and it'll essentially geolocate to where you are. You'll select your location and then it will ask you a series of questions about specific features of that location. So it will ask you about parking um, and, and blue zone parking as Judy described. It will ask you about the slope of the trail. Um, and just to be clear, you don't have to be like a mathematician to you know, exactly calculate the, stro the slope of the trails, but to get, you know, to provide people an understanding of how steep the trail is. Um, it'll ask you about uh, places to sit down, um, other elements of a location that would be important for someone to know to decipher if a location is accessible for them. And it's really important that we have as many uh, surveys about accessible locations filled out with that information because it will provide exactly what everyone has been describing, um, information that a person would need to know, is this place accessible for me, as opposed to a blanket accessibility, which of course doesn't really exist, right? Because everyone is a little bit different. Um, so I definitely encourage you, whether you have a disability or an accessibility challenge or not, um, to definitely take a look at that map, fill out the locations so that someone does not have to end up showing up to a place to find out that it is not accessible for them. They can just go to the birdability map. Your survey will be, geo will be tagged on the map so they can literally click it and see all of your answers about the accessibility of that location. And that does a world of good um, for making the locations that are accessible known to as many people as possible um, and for people to be able to go prepared and understanding the scope of the location where they're birding or looking for wildlife um, outdoors. So thank you so much for that. Again, that is in the chat. So do please feel free to um, click that link and get involved. Um, now, Virginia has mentioned um, a couple of times about um, basically advocacy, right? When you are going to a trail and um, Judy described, Bonnie described, Corey described elements of a trail that um, sometimes can be easily fixed, right? The, the, what we saw just now where Virginia is, there was a path, sorry, there's the golf cart. Um, there was a path and there was a picnic area or a table area, but there was a disconnect between the two. And that could be easily remedied, right? By putting a, a nice just path of concrete between those two features. Um, so Virginia, would you mind sharing the resources Birdability is never shown on resources, y'all, that will help people to advocate, right? So if a person is at a location, what can they do to let the folks know who are responsible for managing that place? Hey, might you consider adding this element to make this a more accessible location? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, if I can jump in, I can't see yeah, it, okay. but you can hear a catbird right now. Oh, yes. Um, those guys are I'm down in our nature conservancy now. So it's a little bit further down. Like I said, it's a little less accessible, uh, specifically for those that you have to use a wheelchair or a device like that. Um, but oh, wait, so there's now a whole different environment. So there's a okay. whole different sleuth of birds here than where I was before. That's cool. And it, was it mimicking? Because cat. For those who have not encountered cat birds, they are mimicking birds. Was it mimicking? Is that what we were hearing, Corey? Yes. Oh, amazing! Amazing. Oh, and could you describe the cat bird for us, real quick? Sorry. <laughs> I actually have not actually seen one before. I've only heard them. Oh, well, I got you. We have catbirds here in Atlanta. Catbirds are these beautiful gray birds. They're like kind of a slate gray all over and they have a darker gray kind of cap on their head and they have rusty colored undertail coverts or butt in other words. Um, very beautiful birds. Okay, Virginia, back I'm to back. you. <laughs> I needed my videographer. Um, so the question is, how do we approach parks, organizations, sites, to help them make their parks more accessible or their sites more accessible. And the first thing I do is when I'm at a site for the first time is I make a note of all the things that are amazing. Um, and then I keep also running a list um, of all the things that could be very easily improved. Um, that's usually where I, that's usually what I take when I go back into the headquarters and ask to talk to the powers that be. 
And I'm always a very um, happy and upbeat and not mad and not irritated and not annoyed person. So when I go in there, I just rave about all the things that are great about the place. And I'm specific about the things that are good. For instance, the slopes, for instance, the ramp, for instance, the railing. The more specific you can be about what works, the better. And plus they feel a little more um, empowered knowing that they have paid attention to these specific things and that they're working. And then the next thing I do is I say, I really want to get this site on the vertibility map. And the way we can do that is, and I start addressing the things that can be improved. And I never show up with a complaint without a solution. So what I'll do is I will go to a picnic table like the one I showed you earlier. And I will say, there is a really easy remedy for this in order to make this picnic table accessible. And that includes blah, blah, blah. And so I will have all of that information at the ready so that they can make that um, improvement right away. And they're not left with me leaving them with a big thing in their lap that they don't know what to do with. That's, to me, that's the approach that is most effective. I also would say one other thing, particularly for these little um, sites, like for instance, in McAllen, I went to the McAllen Nature Center and I loved the site, but it was very difficult for me to manage. But the person who was running the headquarters that day was very interested in finding out what we could do in order to improve it. And so after we talked about that, she said, we don't have any money, how are we gonna do that? And my first thought was, uh, let's identify the 10 most important local businesses in McAllen, you and I together, let's brainstorm at that list right now and start thinking about all the ways in which those 10 local businesses can be the founders of the improvements of the McAllen Nature Center. You know they're gonna wanna be a part of that. If it's the only accessible nature center in McAllen, those businesses are all gonna benefit, especially right now. Virginia, that is incredible. Virginia is a mastermind in advocacy and we are all so lucky to just have her um, to learn from and to advocate for and, and even beyond um, accessibility when it comes to uh, disabilities and things like that. Virginia, you're phenomenal. Um, I know Vertibility has a, a template, right, for um, if folks want to reach out. Uh, would you mind describing that template and where they can find that? Um. Freya knows more about where everything is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of the person at the side making big dreams, but I know there is a resource um, and I think it has to do with a letter that I wrote. And obviously that's a template that anybody can follow. It's probably under guidance documents. Perfect, yes, Freya actually just said as you were talking that she put it in the chat, Freya, you're the bomb. Thank you so very much. Um, so that document, if you want a template that has language that is very helpful, um, to use when you are reaching out to an entity, the powers that be at a location to advocate for certain changes um, or celebrate what they what they do have before you advocate for certain changes, that is there. Um, and so Bird really, really has set everyone up to be able to succeed at advocacy and succeed at creating the most accessible programming um, possible, especially when it comes to the world of birding. So we are extremely fortunate um, to, to have you. Um, I Real quick, we are coming up on the end of the hour. Um, if you all wouldn't mind just saying if there was kind of one or two or as many as you would like, um, but kind of briefly, um, things that you notice in the birding community at large as you all have been part of the birding community in different parts of the, of the country, of course, um, things you would like people to know and to incorporate, um, whether those be physical and structural or the way that people do programming and education. Um, what, what wisdom from your experience would you want to pass on for people to think about and implement as they lead programming for people in the world of birding? And anyone can feel free to, to, to jump in if you'd like. I, I can go ahead and start. Bonnie. Oh. Oh, oh, go ahead, Bonnie. Okay, I was just gonna say that I think uh, one thing that would be good is that for the local chapters, Audubon chapters or other types of birding, uh, organizations to reach out to the disabled community, find out what they want. Don't just create things in a bubble without getting input from the people that you're trying to create it for. Um, you know, recruit people to be on your board with disabilities, uh, on your staff. Um, so I think that's a good place to start uh, to make it more of a systemic change.
That's amazing. Yes. Um, I heard a, a phrase recently from someone um, when it comes to things of relating to equity, nothing about us without us, right? Not creating programs and initiatives and, and efforts to reach a certain community of people and be completely out of touch with that community of people that will obviously yield no, no good results for anybody. Um, and can sometimes in other in, in certain situations end up doing damage and, and not doing any good at all. Um, so it is not only for the purpose of successfully engaging everybody, but also because uh, birding is richer, our experiences outdoor is richer when everybody can participate and everybody has equal ability to participate, equal access to participate. Um, so we all benefit from that. Um, Judy, did you have anything that you wanted to, since you're on the same camera, is there anything that you wanted to add as far as um, what you would like to see uh, changed or adjusted um, in the birding community for folks who are listening? Well, one of the things that I think is really important is for especially different Audubon chapters, different bird organization chapters to actually design bird walks, um, bird strolls that are accessible to people with disabilities and to um, outreach to people with disabilities. And one of the great ways to do that is to partner with a disability organization. So that's one of my continual sources of frustration is I'll see these um, great uh, field trips and they're not accessible. And it would not be that difficult in certain circumstances to um, walk on paths that are accessible or to make these events um, more inclusive. Yes, thank you so much for that, Bonnie. Being very intentional about crafting programming that is in its core accessible. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Virginia? Yes. Karina, hi. Yeah, I kind of wanted to build a little bit on what others have said. Um, I think sometimes we forget that just making all the sites accessible is not intentionally bringing in people who have access challenges. We need to be intentional about finding them and bringing them. And I, I, what that means to me is finding in your location those support groups for people who have access challenges, like I did with the spinal cord injury group, the stroke support group, the amputee support group, the local Easter Seals organization. You gotta find all the people who can benefit. Don't just sit and say, okay, I made it so you can do it and hope that they come. We have to be more intentional about that. That is incredible. And I, if there are any community engagement or anyone involved in outreach who's listening, these are nuggets of gold that apply across all kinds of, of communities. And especially for people who have disabilities or experience access challenges in the outdoors. I hope you're listening. Um, relationships, knowing, building relationships with people, connecting with organizations who are already doing the work, already organized around serving um, the people that you're interested in connecting with is the bedrock, it's the bedrock. Thank you so much, Virginia and Body and Judy for sharing that. Um, Corey, um, as we are wrapping up, are there any particular programmatic um, or uh, behavioral or physical, any sort of changes you would, you would like to see people incorporating kind of that they can take with them right now? Um, I think the biggest thing, I've only been birding for just over a year now after um, I got started working with Audubon. So I'm still really new to the community and, you know, getting in with these like local birding groups, um, things like that, they can be um, somewhat unfriendly and unwelcoming to new birders because they, a lot of people expect the, you to have the same knowledge that they do. Um, so I would say probably, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, just have, if you're kind um, and welcoming to people um, that will, you know, open up the outdoors um, to everyone to come in and, um, I would love to definitely highlight the new stuff that birds are at least putting on that could be especially useful for birds of color and uh, women birders. Um, the safety concerns, um, the questions that were recently um, added and being added to. Um, so every, the outdoors can be not only more accessible, but safer for everybody. That's amazing, Corey. Thank you so, so much for adding that. Um, kindness goes a long way, doesn't it? Um, being able to, to genuinely uplift and support one another. Ooh. Virginia's pointing. Virginia, what do y'all got over there? Yeah, you had a turkey vulture fly overhead. But we also had a female summer tanager. So that's, there's that. Oh! We had somebody singing that we, we couldn't find. It was either a painted bunting or maybe a blue grosbeak. 
it's way, way, way up in the top of that pecan tree <laughs> and on the back side. And um, we could not find that bird, but a uh, fun challenge for another day. He found us. <laughs> he found us, yeah. <laughs> they found you right. We always think we're watching the birds. The birds, they're really watching us. If you have not seen a painted bunting before, if you're listening and if you have not seen or encountered one of these birds, they are literally a rainbow with wings. They've The males in particular if have blue. If yeah. you haven't seen them yet, come visit Virginia and me in Austin and we'll get you on one. They're, they're like thick as thieves down here. They're awesome. That's amazing. Yes, they are. I'll have, I'll have to come and visit you all in Austin. Um, we had someone in the chat mentioned back when we were talking about catbirds, Cynthia said that they had the first catbird in 22 years at their feeder this month. That is a great win and we are so excited for you. Um, all right, so as we close out, um, I do want to again point your attention to the uh, links that Freya put in the chat. Thank you so much Freya for putting those in the chat that take you to all the many resources that BirdAbility has to offer so that everybody can participate in advocating for um, a birding community um, and an outdoor recreation community that is accessible for everybody. So please take advantage of those and share it widely. If you are connected with an Audubon chapter or an Audubon network or a nature network of any kind, share it with the people who are in power, who make decisions, share it with the people um, who use the resources of those organizations because we need to get this information and these stories and perspectives far and wide. Um, so as we close out, are there any last words anyone wanted to share before we wrap up today? Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you being there. Thank you, Karina. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone and uh, especially BirdAbility for um, making this a priority. Sorry, we're fascinating to add a uh, monarch here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, because like everyone else, we just want to say thank you, Karina and Georgia Audubon and BirdAbility and everyone joining us today. It's been fantastic. Yes, thank you so much to, again, BirdAbility, Virginia, Freya, all the folks who are making to work it happen, working to make it happen, excuse me, and to our phenomenal guests, Corey, Bonnie, Judy, Virginia, and Celeste who's behind the camera with Virginia. Uh, we are eternally grateful for your willingness to share your experiences your expertise, your perspective, um, because it helps us all to be better and to do better. And so I'm very grateful that you are willing to do this today. Um, we are excited to hopefully meet you in person, to meet up and go birding one day in person. And maybe we all need to go to Austin to make it happen. I would love that personally. Yes, yes, um, yes. <laughs> yes, all right. please. Yes. <laughs> all right, everyone. We'll have a fantastic rest of your day. And don't forget to look at all the birds you can while you're outside. Have a great day, everyone. Oh, we Thanks got so much. Red, flying red, red shouldered hawk. Red shouldered hawk. <laughs> this always happens as soon as we close out. Some sort right of at the trouble. end. <laughs> it flew over right behind this big pecan tree. Oh so, I guess. <laughs> Amazing. All right, everybody. We'll see you. Bye.